Welcome to the New School of Marketing podcast, the place for smart, simple strategies that will amplify your business results. Sharing practical tips, insider knowledge and actionable advice because marketing is something that every business owner can do. Now, let's get started. Introducing your host, Bianca McKenzie, mum, lover of snow sports, camping, horse riding, and in-demand launch strategist and Facebook advertising knowledge bank. Welcome to the new School of Marketing podcast. I'm Bianca McKenzie, and today I'm talking about reducing the overwhelm of content creation with Mel Daniels. Mel Daniels is a content strategist who empowers women to grow their business with purposeful content that connects, nurtures, and converts. When she's not talking about content and client journeys, you'll find Mel cheering on her clients from the sidelines. Her other favorite hangouts are the kitchen and the gym. Luckily, her love of deadlifting counteracts the amount of baking she consumes. Kind of. I love that. I love baking. I don't love deadlifting, to be honest. Um, Welcome to the show, Mel. It's so exciting to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Bianca. It's um, an absolute honor to be here. I love it. Well, I reckon we're just going to dive right in because content creation, it's like, yeah, it's one of those things that we kind of all need to do. And I know a lot of us don't like doing. So why do you think we feel overwhelmed when it comes to content creation? Because I know I do. Yeah. But so there's so many reasons. I guess that because we know that it's such an important part of our business, um, because it really does help us let our ideal client know exactly who we are, our personality, our brand, what we believe in, our values, and what we don't believe in, as well as to move them along this client journey with us. So because we know that it's such an important piece in our um, business, I think that it puts a lot of pressure on us. And that pressure can then lead to content overwhelm and fatigue and just really not enjoying the whole content creation process. And that's not what I want for you and all of your listeners. I really want content creation to be the most amazing experience because it has purpose and focus. Yeah, I love that. Um, And you're right, we do all, in a way, have to create content, even though I don't like focusing on that, you have to. Mm -hmm. Um, But we we do. (laughs) If, If we want to attract people to us, we do have to create content for our business so I know that you focus a lot on reducing the overwhelm of it and and how to do that can you talk us through um, three examples or three ways we can reduce our content creation overwhelm yeah sure so on a high level I think that the three things are all about knowing the purpose of your content creation and why you're actually doing it then knowing what to create and when for your ideal client. So creating the perfect piece of content to meet them where they are in their client journey right now. And the third third way is to use reimagination. And we can talk about each of these um, separately. But before I do that, Bianca, I also really wanted to put a disclaimer on everything that we're going to talk about today because it's really important to know that you know, when we follow people or listen to people's advice, whether they be coaches or experts in their field, taking what they say and directly trying to implement it into our own business is only going to cause us further overwhelm um, and potentially lead to disappointment because we are different people to what they are. Our businesses are different as well. We're all unique. So we really need to take out of the things that we learn, just take those little bits that really resonate with us and apply them to our businesses. So in that, I think that because we all have our own style, we all have our own unique content creating style. Um, Some of us are really organized and love to schedule content. This is me. (laughs) I love a to-do list. I love ticking things off. But then we have like the opposite end of the spectrum, those people who really find that hard find that really difficult to be that organized for their content creation and prefer to kind of create their content in the moment or in the flow so knowing your content creator style can really help you work with your strengths and realize that um, you know take a bit of that pressure off from you as well I love that I really love that because 
I'm someone who does like a to-do list, but at the same time, I do have those kind of off the cuff um, inspired moments where I go on this content creation, like it's like I just bang it all out and then I have dry spells um, and and that works for me. And mm-hmm. I love that you're saying that, that, that there is this disclaimer because everyone is different and I had to learn what worked for me. And and even over the years, that has changed because when I started my business, I had a lot of um, commuting time. I honestly, I was on a roll on the train pushing out blog posts. But then when I stopped commuting, when I went full time in my business, I didn't have that time anymore. So things changed. And then when I had my daughter, things changed. So I love that you said, just pick the little things that work for you and and then apply that because yeah, replicating what works for someone else is really, that's really tricky. It, It often doesn't work for us. And that's when I guess we do give up on content creation or have that overwhelm. So I really love that. Um, Yeah, absolutely. And just to expand on that, Bianca, um, I think that you touched on something really important as well. We all have different time, energy and resources available to us. So um, the 21-year-old pre-kids me had very different energy to the current 46-year-old mum of teens today. So we really need to also acknowledge and accept that fact, accept that we all have different... um, time different energy and different resources available to us right now so comparing ourselves to someone else out there who's doing who seems to be doing all the things um, is not going to be healthy for us because if we're trying to replicate that and we only have a certain amount of time energy and resources available to us then that's really going to put us straight back into that um, overwhelm of content creation yeah it's like you're directly talking to me because (laughs) I sometimes still feel like that I'm like why can't I do what I used to do and blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, I can't because I do have a toddler around every so often. Well, not every so often, (laughs) majority of the time. And, yeah, your energy is just different. Things post-baby is so different than pre-baby. And, like, I need to let go of that sometimes. And I find it really hard to learn from people now who don't have children Mm -hmm. because the life, like, it's just everything is so different. It's like, yeah. Okay, so I need to basically do what you what you say. Pick what you can take from that and apply it to your own life. And okay. and yeah, it's like you're di- directly talking to me. To be honest, <laughs> good. This is good. This is and I, All right. I love and I love that as well. That you know, you talk about your stage of life having a toddler. A stage of life for a mum having teens is totally different as well. So, um, yeah, as soon as we acknowledge and accept that, we can move on. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just have to keep adapting, to be honest. That's all right. 100%. It's, it's life, isn't it? It's how <laughs> things work. And that's what I've done all over. It's I started with blogging. Now I'm podcasting. Who knows what the future might bring? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> cool. So, so you've talked about the three ways we can reduce our content overwhelm. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So let's dive into the first one. It's knowing the purpose of your content creation. So this is all about really understanding that the reason, one of the main reasons that we need to create content is to move our ideal client through a journey with us. So that's going, taking them from not knowing anything about us all the way through to becoming a raving fan. And the way that I look at the client journey, there's five different phases. And funnily enough, they align quite nicely with um, Facebook and Instagram ads as well if you're if you're thinking about doing this. So if you kind of get into the rhythm of understanding the client journey, then it's going to help you when you do decide to actually go on that advertising journey. So the journey goes from connect So this is where we're um, really first becoming that your ideal client is first becoming aware of you. And it's really like the getting to know you stage where you really have that opportunity to showcase exactly what you're all about and give them the opportunity to respond to that as well. So that's the first phase. And then, then we move on to subscribe phase where we try to get them off the social media platforms and into our email marketing world. Then we're moving to nurture them. So predominantly we're using email marketing at this stage, but we're, they're on your list and they're really ready to learn more about you and what you provide. 
and your aim is to really wow them with value. Um, and then we move into convert. So obviously we want at some stage, we want these um, warm ideal clients of ours to become paying clients. So you're really trying to help them make that decision with clarity and confidence to actually work with you. And then the fifth stage is onboarding. So this is a stage I think, Bianca, that so many people forget about. It's that perfect opportunity to turn them into just a cl- from just a client into the raving fan. So using content to really cement um, an experience with you. So kind of knowing that that journey of five different phases and we're using content with purpose at each of those different um, stages can really help us to take a step back and take a deep breath and realize that what we're creating needs to have a purpose and it really kind of brings us away from that throwing spaghetti at the wall approach to content creation and really uh, helping us focus in terms of our overwhelm. I love that and I hadn't even thought about like I I know that you need all of that content and I have all of that content but I hadn't thought about it in a way of that that all falls on the content creation because a lot of us well I kind of made that mistake you kind of just keep thinking about that top of funnel before they become your client like that kind of content creation Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess everything in your business there's there's always a, a content creation piece um, and I was, when I, when you were talking, I was just thinking about it. I'm like, okay, the top of funnel, the, the piece where you attract clients, I guess that in a way you do put a lot more time into that because you, you need to come up with new pieces all the time, but all of the other parts, mm-hmm. they are, I would say equally, or if not more important, because that's when they become paying clients and I don't know (laughs) I value everyone but my paying clients I value more than you know people who I I'm just kind of um becoming known to but um yeah so we need to put our our time and our effort there as well but I think the good thing is that that's not content creation that has to happen all the time it's it, it you create it and then you can use it for quite a while. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we're going to talk about reusing or reimagining um, later. But I think at the opposite, um, the opposite scenario to what you just discovered, where you are really good at focusing on that, um, what you call top of funnel or the connection piece with your ideal client. I think that a lot of people also um, just focus on the sales or the conversion side of things and are constantly putting out promotions and trying to sell yep. and are missing those you know, three bits that come before it, missing that connection, missing getting them on, trying to get them on your email list and missing the opportunity to nurture them. And on just focusing on that conversion process, we're really not hitting the mark. Whereas if we go back to the beginning and and really think about um, our content as creating that connection with someone and bringing them into our world, then we can start um, getting them into our world and nurturing them and converting them as well. So it it kind of works both ways, doesn't it? Yeah, it totally does. Mm -hmm. So in a way, if we think about our client journey, um, we kind of have to plan it out and like map it out, like each step of of that process. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know we both talk about roadmaps quite a bit. Can you talk about your kind of roadmap? Yeah. about this yeah sure so um, when we understand the purpose of our content creation so that's knowing the client journey then the next step is understanding what types of content we can create at each stage to um, take our client along that journey and what ki- kind of what kinds of content actually work best in each stage as well so Let's just pick com, com, um, connect as an example. So that's the very beginning of the um, the journey. So what we're looking at there is creating pieces of focus content for those people who aren't sure what focus content is. That's either you know it's your main piece of content. So for Bianca, it's podcasting at the moment. For myself, it's blogging. For other people, it might be some sort of video content. So um, those pieces that begin to educate. So what are we Um, How do we actually do what we do, why we do what we do, um, a bit of how we do what we do as well can really work well at that stage. 
We're going to use social media posts as well. So this is um, those pieces that really give your ideal client insight to who you are. And I really encourage people to, um, you know, post pictures of themselves and talk about themselves. I know it's so difficult. It took me (laughs) so long to feel comfortable doing this, Bianca. It's just ridiculous. But I want to encourage you, if you haven't done that yet, really um, think about letting your ideal client know who you are because we all know that people connect and buy from people. And I will 100% guarantee you that if you post something about yourself, it will get the best engagement. It's just amazing. It's yeah, it's amazing. funny, isn't it, how people, yeah. they just love the sticky beak into our <laughs> lives. I probably i am not doing it enough because when you and, you and I were talking before the podcast started, it's just been raining here. What can I tell? What can I show people? Rain. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but maybe, I, sorry, um, maybe I need to come up with content pieces that, yeah, show my new life in Tassie, yeah. like, you know, yeah. letting out my chickens and things yeah. like that. But, yeah, you're right. Everyone yeah. just loves a good content piece that shows a little bit behind the scenes. And um, while you were talking about that, I actually saw a post, I can't remember who posted it, but um, of how you can show more of your of your life without showing yourself. And I think there were some tips in there um, along the lines of, you know, like show behind the scenes, show how you create something or like you don't always have to put your actual self okay. into it. People do want to know what you look like. That That's just the part of, you know, people's nature. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are also other options and other ways to show more about that kind of thing without showing you. Like I could show my chickens. A hundred percent. I totally agree with that. And I think that in um, sharing you and your life, you really need to check in with what feels comfortable and what feels right for you and what also um, will make sense in the scheme of the service that you provide as well. So, yeah. um, yes, you don't have to show your face. You can show your chickens. You could show um, some wellies. You could show the back of your um, beautiful daughter in her wellies, you know, th- things like that. You can talk about um, your move and how that's impacted you. So there's so many things that we can talk about ourselves, but, we, yes, we really need to check in with how much we want to share and how much we're prepared to share. Yeah, true. But it is true what you said. People do love looking into people's lives. And I can 100% back this up with data for my clients. Um, Great. The ones that I see have better performance are the ones that do. Uh, they do they do stories they do reels they show their lives they show, like they show their lives in all their mess and all their glory um and and they do get better results in in general so yeah yeah and, but even if you don't feel comfortable sharing that level of personal detail um share things around your values and your beliefs and yeah. i think that that really helps your ideal client go wow, yes, I really agree with that or I really disagree with that. Yeah. That's, that's great as well. But I really agree with that. And wow, yes, I would love to work with a person who thinks the same way as me. Yeah, yeah. That's always such a like a nice thing when you connect with someone on a call and you're like, oh, you just get me. So that's awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... All this content creation, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier about reimagining, explain it to us because I, like, I know a little bit about what it is, but it's, I, it's, it's like what what I built my business on. So I really would love for you to share that with your, with my listeners as well. Awesome. Okay. So I think this is the linchpin. This is the absolute key to overcoming your content creation overwhelm because reimagination is all about um, repurposing, basically. <laughs> I use the word reimagination because it's so much more exciting than the word repurpose yep. or reuse. So um, 
And a little story about why I actually use the word reimagination is because my daughter, who is almost 13, is at the moment into Disney again. So she went through her Disney princesses phase when she was little, then denounced all things Disney for several years, and then all of a sudden is really back into Disney, so much so that she's actually got her own Disney podcast. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. But she, in in that um, re discovering um disney and what disney was about obviously we watched a thousand um disney documentaries so i know a lot of random stuff about disney but one of the most amazing things that really kind of touched touched my heart and really resonated with me is that um they have employees that work in like the disney parks side of things and they are called imagineers so it is the job of an imagineer to come up with crazy ideas and make them work so whether that's a new ride whether that's um the way that the park looks that's their job like they can't fail they just get to try out new new things but also one of their um key roles is to take existing rides and turn them into something else so um i'm going to get the names of these rides wrong but It's like the, not the haunted house, but it was a similar ride to that. It's now been changed to um, something to do with Marvel. So they've taken exactly the same thing, but just tweaked it ever so slightly and made a few changes and made it into something totally new. And this is what we can do with our content as well. So um, what I really encourage people to do is to have that one piece of focus content. So that's the blog the podcast or the video and then from there we take um, the ideas from that particular piece of content and create micro content for want of a better better term so content that we can actually use on our social media and in different places that we um, hang out so I don't know do you want do you want me to give you a bit of an example Bianca yeah I'd love that Okay, so let's just take what I do as an example. So every fortnight I write a blog. It's only 500 words, okay? So it doesn't need to be this massive um, creation. It's just a 500-word blog. And from that blog, the way that I write it and the way that I structure it, I can pull out um, paragraphs that I use as tips. So I put these on my social media. I use them in Facebook groups that I hang out in. I use them in so many different ways. So just pulling out those tips and I pull out quotes as well from myself. So, you know, um, something that I've actually said inside of my blog becomes a pretty graphic that I use on social media as well. So all of these things can be broken into posts on Facebook. I use them as the basis of my Facebook lives once a week. Um, I use them on Instagram so they can be put in my feed They can be used as um, a live on Instagram as well. The live then feeds into an IGTV. I can use each tip as a different story. And if I was into reels, I could use them um, in reels as well. So there's so many different ways that you can take your core content and then reuse it. And of course, we can use it in our email marketing as well. So a lot of people um, have such a huge resistance to email marketing because they feel like, a, their ideal client doesn't want to hear from them, bum, bum, that's wrong, yeah. and, and B, they don't have anything to say. But they do because they've written this piece of core cool content that they can use as the basis of their email as well. So that's just like a really quick example. And on top of that, you could add in so many things. You could add in Pinterest, you could add in LinkedIn, you could add in what you talk about on Clubhouse. You know, there's so many things that you could do. But we also then need to take a deep breath, don't we, and make sure we don't end up back in overwhelm because there's so many things to do. But just picking a couple of those can make such a huge, huge difference to the um, quantity of new content that you're actually creating. Yeah, I love it because I kind of do the same thing. Maybe there's probably more that I can do, to be honest, but um, I create this, this podcast. It gets shared through my email marketing um, I have an assistant, I have a marketing assistant who <laughs> listens to it and pulls a quote out that I talk about, um, or in this case, this episode that you talk about. Okay. And yeah, we use that on socials as well. We kind of, every podcast episode gets two social posts on um, the new School of Marketing Instagram feed. 
I really should start putting it on my personal, <laughs> I call it my personal one, but everything is blurred, right? <laughs> um, but I should start using it there as well. But yeah, I love it that you don't have to constantly reimagine. Oh, no, actually it is reimagining. Re, you don't have to constantly create new content. You can use content that you've created and to be honest and I know um I've been listening to um Denise Duffel Thomas because she recently started a podcast she's been reusing content from you know, like she always talks about similar things or the same things or in, mm-hmm. the same things in a new way and I do this too like there's blog posts that I've written five years ago and I go through all of the blog posts and I kind of go okay well how can I touch on this topic again but put a, like, you know, put a new coat of paint on it. Um, so you don't constantly have to come up with new, new, new. Like how is how are there other ways to talk about that same thing? Like, and, and that's what I do love about it too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, I think that you've, you really did touch on something there that you can go back and look at what you've created in the past and don't be afraid to use that again as well because our ideal client really needs to hear the same message over and over and over again to become more comfortable or what you call um, you call it no like and trust. Um, they really need to know hear that message so many times to start to feel comfortable and want to purchase from you as well. So, yeah, definitely go back and, and have a look at what you've created in the past as well. I know we're kind of like in a way like toddlers we we have to be told five million times <laughs> um and that and not only that I know that there's people that have been following me for you know five six seven I don't know how many years but some people have not so when they come into my network work right now it's new content to them even though I've talked about it before in a different way so yeah that's why I that's how I reuse my content as well. Might sound like cheating to some people, but <laughs> it's like okay, gold, gold star from me, Bianca. <laughs> I don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? <laughs> awesome. I love all of this. So basically, to recap it a little bit, people need to know their client's journey. And my takeaway from this, and I've never kind of done this in an episode but my takeaway from this is that everything is content creation and it's not just the the top of the funnel the connect piece or the the sales piece the convert piece like those yes we focus on those a lot Mm -hmm. but there's the next stages and you kind of opened my eyes to that in terms of like like I know I have the content but I'd never kind of thought about that as content creation so Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to sit down and like do the whole mapping thing again and and map out my client journey and look at the pieces of content do you have any tips for me and for my (laughs) listeners (laughs) well just um if you go through those five phases so if you write them down the connect subscribe nurture convert and onboard and really think about what your ideal client is thinking feeling and doing at those stages then you're going to really hit the mark in terms of your content creation and the type of content that you create too. Oh my God. That's the best ending to this episode. Thank you so much. I love it. (laughs) And I am literally going to listen back to this and write it down and do it. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Bianca. Cool. All right. Well, I always ask two extra questions at the end of the podcast. What are you curious about right now? I am curious about um, something to do with content, content, and that is Pinterest. I'm really curious at how um, Pinterest can drive traffic and how the, my ideal client may use Pinterest to find me. Interesting. Listen back to the episode I did with Rose um, Guthrie because we did a Pinterest episode. And, yeah, Pinterest is an interesting beast. It's like a, it's kind of like a search engine. So I love it. That's great. Um, If you had an extra $1,000 in your marketing budget, what would you spend it on? I would spend it on something related to Pinterest. I would actually spend it on um, a third-party scheduler for Pinterest. Mm -hmm. Um, And also maybe if there was a bit left over, I would actually use it for um, looking into Pinterest 
advertising as well. Interesting. I love it. It's awesome. Well, that is the end of this week's show. If you have any questions about content creation and how to ditch the overwhelm with it, head to meldbusinessservices.com.au or connect with Mel on Facebook or Instagram and I'll pop all of the links in the show notes so you can find Mel there. A really big thanks to you, Mel. I really loved having you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a wonderful um, discussion. I really hope your listeners get something out of it. I'm sure they will. Uh, I I know I have, so I'm sure they will. (laughs) Um, A big thanks to you for listening. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you heard the podcast. Your review will help others find the show and learn more about the amazing world of online marketing. And don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode at newschoolofmarketing.com where you can learn more about Mel, check out useful links, download free resources, and leave a comment about the show. 